What are some things you said about Confucianism? If you were to tell somebody about Confucianism that really has no idea what it is, what would you say? Victoria, what would you say? Give me one thing. Trusting other people. What else? Katie? Loving your family members. What else? Ah, Allison, there you go. Five relationships. Can you give me one of them? One of the five? Father and son. What's mother? Father and son. What does it say again? Yep, older brother, younger brother. Good. Others. Allison, I know you're brilliant and everything, but you can let other people say some stuff here. What else? Anybody? Aiden, you have one? Well, do you remember five relationships? Not even one. So we have, we, we, I heard someone say something. Yep, friend and friend. Now we're getting more difficult. Husband to wife. Good. Huh? No, that's more friend to friend. Um, friend to friend basically means like person to person. Doesn't, it doesn't have to be like your pal or anything. But lastly, there's one more left. So we said four. What's the last one? We're talking about the Confucianism. What, do you know, uh, five relationships, Dan? What? Five relationships. You remember them from Confucianism? Confucianism. So we, we talked about father, son, brother to brother, husband to wife, friend to friend. No, not the sister. Not the TV show from Disney Channel. What was it? No, that's friend to friend. So it's close. It's close to that one. There's one more. Ruler to slave. Well, not slave, but. We're subject, right? That was probably so you're close, but subject, right? So, father the son, husband the wife, brother the brother, friend the friend, and ruler and subject, right? Those are the five relationships. Now, why did Confucius make that? Do you remember why he made that concept of five relationships? What era was he born in? What was going on when he was raised? What's going on in China? Chill, chill setting. What was going on? The Warring States period, right? <laughs> so Warring, okay, um, Warring States period, okay. Warring States period was basically a time of massive amount of civil war. All these different groups were against each other. So when he comes in, right, and he tries to implement this five relationships, he thinks that well, if these aristocrats or these elites followed his concept, this war wouldn't have happened. Um, good. Okay, so what we're going to do is talk a little bit about the Han Dynasty, and then we'll jump into the homework of the day. Okay, so uh, let's just talk about this briefly. So we finished section two the other day, um, and now we're going to be on section three, which is the last section. We should finish this chapter by the end of the week, but obviously you'll be on break, which means that when you come back from break, we will have our assessment on chapter 7. Okay, So that means that um, during break you'll have your uh, assignment to help you summarize everything you've done and you'll also open up your study guide. So if you want to work on your study guide over break you can do so. So you'll be assessed when you come back from break. Okay, So uh, let's jump right in. Okay. So when we talk about the Han Dynasty. We're talking about China, obviously, um, and the Han Dynasty is going to be really influential. Now, we talked about China quite a lot. We've had several different chapters referencing China and their growth over time. The first time we talked about China was during the Shang Dynasty, right? And that's kind of the picture there. Then we talked about them during the Zhao. See how they get a little bit bigger. Then the Qin Dynasty. Also, way you can spell it is Q I N. The last time we talked about them, and now the Han Dynasty is even growing even larger. So clearly you can see that the Han Dynasty is going to be very successful in what they're doing. So to understand what's going on to get us to this point, we talked about China last time with the Qin Dynasty. And remember the leader of the Qin Dynasty was Shi Wan Di, right? Remember this guy? And what was some things he implemented? So there was like these ethical systems, right, that were in place. Which ethical system did he put in place? Do you remember? What ethical system did he use? It starts with L. So that's the word legal. So it's this ethical system, right? That she won D uses. It starts with the L. And I give you a hint. It starts with the word legal. What is it? Legal. No. 
ism. Legalism. Yeah, well, well, yeah, I remember that. Legalism. Oh, wow, I can't believe. I remember that the whole time. Dan, stop doing that. You set, right, where basically all subjects have to abide by whatever the ruler says. Right, so if you're looking at, it's basically the opposite of Confucianism. Now, what you're saying to yourself, well, Confucianism has this idea of being respectful to rulers. True. So if I'm looking at, like, legalism, right, and how it works. So this is the ruler and the subject. The subject has to abide by what the ruler says. Does the ruler have to give anything back in return? No, right? Not at all. The subject has to listen to whatever and give everything to the ruler. Confucianism, let's now look at the same type of symbols here. Confucianism is respecting one another. So the subject has to give something to the ruler, as in respecting your superiors. But what does the ruler have to give back in return in order for Confucianism to work? So the ruler has a law, the subject has to listen to the law, but what does the ruler have to do in return to help this two-way street relationship? What does a good king do for the people? Make them happy. In what way? Say it again? Win wars. Win wars. Keeping them safe. Being nice. Being, being nice when you need to be. Right? Sharing is caring. Yeah, sure. Sharing is caring. Right? Having, yeah. having public works to help the general public not have too outrageous of laws that make everyone miserable. These are all things that a ruler must do. So it's like a give and take relationship. A two way street. And the same thing you could say about the other five, the other four relationships. Right? Father and son. You're going to respect your father, but the father needs to put you, give you guidance. He needs to keep you fed. He needs to keep you safe. right? And that's the important thing about Confucianism. So the differences between Confucianism and legalism are very different. Legalism is more strict, and a subject always gives everything to the ruler without to really give anything back. Right? Confucianism is a little bit different there. So Shi Wan Di follows in legalism. He actually hires, remember the advisor, was Li Shi, the co-founder. Li Shi? Li Shi? Yeah, L-I-S-I. -I. Li Shi, right? And he was a co-founder of legalism. So when he's in place, Shi Wan Di ends up doing a lot of really messed up and aggressive things. Right? High taxes, harsh punishments, harsh labor, quota system. And if you don't follow any of the quota system or taxes, you get put in prison for your whole life. These are all things that make the peasants of, of China really hate the Qin Dynasty to a new level. So when the happening is when Shi Wan Di, who is a, the top leader of the time, passes away, the rival kings that he once conquered try to rebel. And now they're in a full on civil war, warring states pure, period, yet again. Now, people that emerge as the leaders of this group um, are two people Zhang Yu and Lu Bang. Okay? Now, Zhang Yu is like the leader of this movement, while Lu Bang is his top general, like his right-hand man. And as they, they both become very powerful, Lu Bang ends up turning against Zhang Yu and ends up fighting into like the battle to the death to see who's going to lead society. Okay, and Lu Bang ends up winning in 202 BC, and he starts the Han Dynasty. Okay, now the Han Dynasty is very successful, it lasts for 400 years, to the point where China... There are people in China that call themselves people of the Han because the Han Dynasty was so influential on modern day China today. Okay? Now, one thing that you need to understand that the Han Dynasty is going to be famous for having a very well organized, very powerful central government. And we'll get into exactly some aspects of that. But what happens with Lu Bang is that he becomes extremely popular because instead of following legalism, he follows Confucianism. And the first thing he does to help the peasants who really like him is he lowers the taxes and he makes punishments not as severe. Because he was a peasant himself. So he realizes that I kind of have to make, make nice with all these peasants. Because they outnumber literally the entire upper echelon of the government. Now Lu Bang, this is a very famous story here, Lu Bang ends up passing away. Now at the time, he has a very, very young child who is put in as the new emperor. And when you're super young, you don't really have a lot of sway over the higher ranking officials. What ends up happening is that his wife, Empress Lu, ends up basically controlling the Chinese government by basically kind of like coercing her son to do certain things that's basically her leading the government. And then what happens is her son dies at a very young age, and to keep her power, she starts appointing infant rulers. Like children, straight up like five-year-olds, 
Like, oh, that's the next emperor. And the reason why she does that is so that she can keep controlling the society. Right? And she uses that, and also the other aristocrats around her also agree with her rule. Now, the problem is, is that when she passes away, the, po the politics of China start to go like crazy. Like they're, they start to like really compete on who's going to be the next ruler of China. And in the long run, the grandson of Liu Bang, Wu Di, ends up becoming the next leader. Right? Now, Wu Di is a very success successful emperor of this empire. Right? He, he, li he rules from 141 to 87 BC, and he creates this very centralized, very strong uh, government, in, very similar to what Liu Bang had once done. Now, he becomes extremely powerful in military-wise, and he ends up defeating a Mongol group northwest of his territory, and it ends up really controlling a lot of the area in which he fought for. Now, what he does is he sends a lot of soldiers, a lot of settlers, to kind of colonize these areas so that they can try to expand their empire. For instance, if you take a look at the map here, this is the land that was originally from the Han Dynasty where his grandfather had first taken over. Now take a look at what it looks like after he takes over. It's massive. It's a massive change. Okay. Now to understand why he was successful, why this government was so famous, he ends up a very structured bureaucracy. I and mean, we I feel like I say that word every single day, but he has a very strong bureaucracy, and basically it's divided into different subgroups. For instance, you take a look at this pyramid here. Obviously, the emperor is on top, but underneath him is going to be kings and governors that kind of rule over certain provinces or areas. And then under them would be state officials and nobles that kind of do the daily tasks. And then beneath them is going to be everybody else. Now, the, the interesting thing about this bureaucracy is that, firstly, they basically collect taxes to help pay for public works, but they also make sure that every citizen in China does one of two things. Either they work a year of service in the military, or they work for the government to help build certain infrastructure, or like buildings and roads and stuff. And by doing this, they really are successful in making really the system of communication and roads and infrastructure of China really good. Like they build a lot of roads, a lot of buildings, canals, irrigation systems, they make their military a lot better, and they even expand the Great Wall of China. But the most impactful thing, and this will guaranteed be on your assessment, is the implementation of the civil service exam. Now what this exam really is, is basically, and even today, Anytime you want to be certified in something, like for instance, for as a teacher, I had to take like several exams to get pass in order to be considered a teacher. And that's even before I even get a job, right? But to get certified in something, you have to pass this test, just like a driver's test. You have to pass the test in order to be certified to drive anywhere. And that is said for a lot of different things in society. But what Woody does is he implements a civil service exam, which basically assesses what your education it also assesses whether or not you know anything about Confucianism and whether or not you deserve to be in the, federal, in the really the centralized government, right? So basically, this test allows anybody to take it. This, this can mean the elites of society. This could be the peasants of society. And if you pass this test, you get a government job. So let's just say you're a peasant and you pass this test. Somehow, your entire family is now moved up in the social ladder. Your entire family. So this now gives an incentive to people to want to pass this test and get educated. And what helps in this process is that Woody loves Confucius and his Confucianism so much, he opens up more schools than ever before. Now, instead of having a society of basically peasants who can't read, you're going to have a society of people that can read and are trying to learn. So this makes society and government a lot better. Because instead of it being about hiring people that you know and you're friends with, it's about hiring people who deserve the job. Okay? And that's why it was the biggest impact of Rudy and especially Confucianism. Alright, with that being said, let's go into the worksheet of the day, which is the Confucianism DBQ, and I'll explain the different parts of this. Okay, let's go here. Alright, so once you open up the document going to look like this. Now, you see, this is based from a DBQ, but we won't be doing the DBQ part because I'm just such a nice person. I'm, I'm like really like a... Um, you don't know what a DBQ is? A DBQ is a document-based question. A document-based question essay, right? And usually, when you do a DBQ, you get like a list of documents, 
and then you write uh, at the end of all the answering all the questions, you write a long essay. So the parts you're going to do is you're going to answer the questions, and you'll write a short written response. It's not an essay. It's like a paragraph. Okay. And what you're going to do with your group is you're going to go through the different documents, answer the questions, and at the very end, there's going to be a written task. And basically says for you to answer these three questions or these three prompts by using documents to help you answer them. Okay? So your goal today, and you have quite a lot of time. I kind of set you up to be able to get this done today. Like this should be done by today because it's so easy. Yes. Go ahead. All right. So work with your groups. You can accomplish this pretty quickly. All right. So, and there's only really, what is it, seven documents? Yeah, seven documents. Each document gets at least one question. Like, I think total each question, one document gets two. You can get this done easily. What's up, Dan? Yeah, I know the map one has two. But every that means you have eight questions and you have the written response. That's super easy. All right, so let's get started on that right now. You don't have, you don't have any homework. You can you can do it in a group, but like I like I normally say, if I see you're not doing your work, then.